Um, we're going to be focusing on food and sort of holiday celebrations. Okay. Okay. Um, so I think first of all, um, it would be interesting to sort of understand the traditional holidays or celebrations um, you experienced as a child. So if you just want to sort of maybe talk us through um, the key ones. Okay. Well, you know, we were Christian and so we just followed the Christian holidays. Um, uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas were big deal. You know, we would get together. Um, we were five children. Not many people would invite us over, but my, my father was very, uh, he was very hospitable and he was always inviting people over. Is this, is this, okay. He was always inviting people over. And so we always had a lot of people, my grandmother, my, I had two, when I was growing up, I had two uncles who weren't married and um, they would come over. Um, and, you know, after dinner, we would go visit grandma or we'd visit Auntie Helen or uh, and there was always a lot of food, uh, but you know, for Thanksgiving and Christmas, the traditional American food was what my mother prepared, and she made a lot of it. Um, uh, she always had when we had company. She always had maza, which I don't know. Do you know kibbeneya? That's raw kibbe, and that um, I mean, we loved it. It's uh, raw lamb with bohrod and spices, grated onions, and uh, my husband, who's, you know, uh, Americania, <laughs> uh, Irish, German, um, when he had it, he loved it. He loves Kibbeneya. Um, and it's served um, with scallions and olive oil, and you put it on, on bread. Um, always had hummus, always had baba ganoush, always had olives and khyar, which are cucumbers. Um, but, you know, my mother, um, her, her big specialty, she was known for making kibbeh balls. I don't know what they're called. All I know is kibbeh troblesia is the kibbeh balls with uh, yogurt. Uh, but I don't know what the balls are called. Anyway, she was an expert. Uh, and when my brother got married, he got married in our home. Uh, she and my aunts got together and they maybe made a hundred of these kibbeh balls, um, which my mom was an expert. She, and she never fried them. When you go to a restaurant, you have them fried. But mom, she would bake them and they were fabulous. Um, you know, we had all the typical Syrian Lebanese food. Um, my mom, um, oh, I have a story about my grandmother. Grandma would come over to our house um, and my mother would get a leg of lamb, okay? And grandma would bone that leg of lamb. I would remember sitting in the kitchen with her, fascinated. And from this one uh, leg of lamb, because we had a lot of lamb growing up, as she would uh, divide the meat into, okay, this is for kibbe, and this is for wara anib, which is stuffed grape leaves, and this is for whatever. She would get three or four meals out of one leg of lamb. Yeah. Um, and she was an incredible cook too, my grandma. And my mom- I'm sorry. She, my mother didn't believe in using anything prepared. She always made everything from scratch. And there was a uh, Syrian Lebanese bakery um, a few blocks from our house. And you'd get the best, we called it Syrian bread. And uh, no place, I've not been able to ever have as good bread as that came. And the woman, I, I guess I told you she would, uh, there was lines waiting for this bread. <laughs> she would uh, be very sparing in how many she would let you have. 
but yeah, yeah. Be amazing do you yeah. remember your favorite dish as a child oh, absolutely uh wara anib which is stuffed grape leaves and i think i told you the story yeah. of my grandmother <laughs> stopping my father and we pick the leaves along the country road but my mother later on um i guess when we were teenagers she um she planted a grapevine and so she would get her leaves from the backyard and if she had too many leaves, she would she would prepare she would preserve them she would take them wash them let them dry and then she'd roll them up with salt and wrap them in wax paper and freeze them uh, so whenever she wanted and and it's made i don't know if you've ever had wara and it's it's meat with rice and garlic and and uh, allspice and pomegranate syrup which is called dips ruman uh, it's tangy and sweet that's how the people from uh, Aleppo would make their uh, water and which they called yebra uh, in Aleppo they called it. in in uh, Damascus it was water and um the meat would be prepared not with the uh, pomegranate syrup but with yogurt and then it's cooked it would be cooked with lamb's tongue um, or lamb and or lamb's bones and lots of garlic and lemon juice and you know for, that was my favorite favorite was it um reserved for sort of specific special occasions or mm, no, no mom, mom just made it when she had the grape leaves and when she felt like it so um yeah she uh she was such a great cook. And she taught me, you know, how to make all of this stuff. So is that something that um, you like fed your children um, on the oh, right basis? Yeah, I, I would make it, but I haven't made it in a long time because I, it was hard, it'd be hard to get the leaves in Granville, Ohio, and you'd have to get them in a jar and they would be tough. Um, but uh, one day <laughs> I had this friend, um, her name was Barbara Boston. Her husband taught music uh, at Denison. And she was, her family was from Syria. And they, one day we went around Granville picking these grape leaves that, what, that grow wild. And we made uh, what it ended together. Um, yeah. Um, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And you can also make the same thing with, um, with cabbage, cabbage leaves. And, and it, it's a lot of work. And I worked. And, you know, um, I, I didn't make it as often as Are I would like. Are there any other sort of dishes that you ate on a regular basis as a child? Okay. Of yeah, mom, mom would make um, a shish kebab, we called the lahamishri, and she would marinate the lamb in uh, oil and uh, vinegar and onions and allspice, and that the lamb got that flavor, and uh, we had that pretty frequently. I love that. And mom would make her rice uh, two ways. Um, one, you saute these very fine noodles in, in butter, and then you add the rice and you add, mom would use chicken stock. I, I, I cook the same way, um, and people love that rice. Or another way of making the rice, uh, and she would uh, stuff, um, stuff chicken, or she would uh, stuff lamb's breast with rice that was flavored with meat and allspice. Um, and uh, yeah, you saute the meat and you, you add the spices and then you add the rice and uh, usually chicken broth and cook it. You can make that as a, a meal, not just uh, use it as a stuffing. Was having these 
sort of traditional Arab dishes um, that you grew up eating important to you to sort of, I'm sorry, pass on to your children and well, uh, my kids all my kids all left uh, after college, and then one lived in San Francisco, the other in Chicago, the other in Washington. So, but uh, I did show them how to make some things. My my boys and my daughter all make Syrian food, um, and uh, they make kibbe, which you know what kibbe is. It's ground lamb or beef, you grate onions uh, into it, and you put a bulhor, and you, you make sort of a, a meat paste. And so you make a, a, a kibbe sinia, not the balls. The sinia is, uh, you would put a layer of that meat on the bottom of a pan, and then you'd saute meat with onions and flavor it with uh, cinnamon and allspice and you put that over that first layer of kibbe then you put another layer of kibbe and then you score it like you score um uh, uh butlawa baklava and you bake it with butter and oil and yeah my kids all make that i make that a lot that's not so hard but <laughs> i have a story uh, my mom didn't make, uh, I call it butlawa, but you call it baklava. Um, one day, my mother didn't make it, but one day, I guess I was 12, Pop came home and he was going to make butlawa. <laughs> he was at this uh, Syrian grocery store and the man was making it and he watched the man make it and he came and he, Pop just made it. And it's really very easy to make. And I make that a lot. Um, uh, make butlawa and you can also make, using the phyllo dough, you can make triangles which you fill with ricotta. Oh, I'm thinking of all these wonderful things. Um, there's, a, well, my favorite, my favorite, favorite dessert was called Ish Suraya. And my great aunt Linda used to make it. And you get like um, a, a round ball of French or Italian bread and you let it get stale and you cut the crust off. And then you cook this bread in a sugar syrup. Um, and you put one layer on the bottom of, of your plate and or, or a pan, you put it on a pan, and then you make a, a filling of with ricotta and cream that you fill. You know, you you could put a little cinnamon in it, or and you put that on top of this bread, and then you put another layer of this bread, and then you put pistachio nuts on top, and you put it under the broiler, and. Uh, uh, and the sugar syrup is flavored with either orange flower water or rose water. And it's, my great aunt Bertha said, it's called the bread of the kings. I mean, it, it is, it's a lot of work to make. Bless you. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, so is there a specific dish that you still make for holiday celebrations um, now? No. No. Uh, the, the, the things that I would make um, are things that are easier. Like I would make butlawa and I would make, um, there's something called namura, which is some, uh, 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 made out of semolina um, that you, you know, flavor with. Um, or oh, you put butter and yogurt. I forget how to make it. I haven't made it in a while. But um, let's see, what else do I make? Oh, oh, I make these uh, cookies. I can't I forget what they're called. And you put sesame seeds on top. And the thing is to make them as thin as you My mother made the best. She She made the dough real thin. It was a butter dough. And you put, um, you brush the dough with, uh, with honey or sugar syrup, and then you put these sesame seeds on top and you bake them. Oh, like a sesame snap. 
Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. But you know, you go to a Middle Eastern grocery and they have them, but they're thick. They're not, nothing was like my mother made. She made them so thin. And I, when I made them, yeah. Um, yeah, for, for holidays, um, I don't, because it's a lot of work. Syrian food is a lot of, it's, it's very labor intensive. And, um, oh, one thing that I do make, and my grandmother's, my mother's family made it. It's called Nlochia. And it is my children's favorite. Uh, my father from Aleppo, they never made it. But, when my, but he wouldn't eat it because it's made out of um, these Mlachia leaves. And it, it, it's kind of mucusy, like, you know, like uh, okra. Um, it, it's a soup. And it's flavored with uh, coriander and garlic. And you serve this soup. Uh, with um, rice and kibbeh. You would put kibbeh in this soup or chicken. And my kids love it. And I make that a lot. I have a friend who's Palestinian and she makes melukhiya and it's totally different. Um, but I, I think melukhiya might have been more Egyptian. Maybe. I don't know. Because my grandmother, my mother's mother, lived in Egypt for a while and grandpa so who knows but in Aleppo they don't have Mukhiya. <laughs> so you've mentioned a couple of times that um, maybe I think your grandparents um, or definitely your grandmother grew up in South America. Um, yeah. to my extent, mother. My mother. Uh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Uh, your mother. So did sort of South American cuisine sort of come mm -hmm. into your life like what? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that have an impact yeah. on the Arab dishes. Yeah, um, mom would make, and grandma would make this uh, saffron rice um, with either shrimp or with chicken. And um, that that's the only thing that was South American. Although uh, uh, when I was teaching, my mother came to visit and it was grandparents day and my mother came in and she talked to, to my students about growing up in, in uh, Colombia. And she said she, her favorite thing was a soup called Sancocho, which when I visited South America, uh, I had it and I wasn't impressed. <laughs> but my mother loved it. And she never made it. But she uh, and grandma, and my grandmother used to live with us during the summers. Um, they would make this wonderful rice that they flavored with with saffron, and um, sh they'd have either put shrimp or chicken in it. But that was that was it. So, um, so speaking about the summers, um, you mentioned you've mentioned Tannersville a couple of times, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. sort of as a sort of center of Arab life in your summer. Oh, yeah. Was there? Did you eat different food while you were there? Sort of, could you talk? We about had, that? we had all the mostly Syrian food and relatives and friends, mostly relatives, because we were a big family on both sides, would get together and they'd have these barbecues. And I remember they would grill chicken and it's just put it on the, on the barbecue and that was it. And it was the best. And I've never had chicken as good as, good as that. And you know, they would, they made American food. Oh, they would make um, tabbouleh um, and, you know, um, tomatoes and cucumbers and watermelon were big things in the, in the Syrian diet uh, during the summer. So uh, we always had watermelon, uh, always had cucumbers, always had fresh tomatoes and um, my father's at the dinner table, you know, when we would have watermelon, he'd say, Chubiz jibna u That's what he wanted. Chubiz is bread, jibna is cheese, and jebesa is uh, watermelon. And he loved that. And we would have that uh, in the summer. 
when, when they had watermelon? So moving away from food and sort of back to sort of celebrations, mm -hmm. um, you were in Tannersville, did, were there any sort of like events, celebrations that you partook in? Oh, only uh, getting together for these barbecues. And, you know, there would be 20 people there at least, you know, uh, aunts. My father had uh, two sisters. My mother had uh, two sisters. So, you know, um, yeah, it was, it was a big thing. And all the kids, all the cousins, we'd run around. Now, in the summertime, when we didn't go up to Tannersville, um, we... All the, my mother and her Syrian friends and her sisters and sisters-in-law would gather up all the kids and we'd go to the beach. We'd go to Reese Park, uh, which is in Queens. It's, um, it's not as famous as Rockaway or Coney Island. It was cleaner. It's cleaner than any, than Coney Island. We never went there. But yeah, we would, we would go there during the week um, bring lunch, and it was always on Syrian bread, <laughs> um, and, you know, we, we would just hang out with cousins, go swimming, even if the waves were huge. I, I look at the ocean sometime and, and see these huge waves and thought, boy, I was brave. I would never do that again, <laughs> going to that kind of water. You get, you get a little bit skittish when you get older. So I'm interested in understanding um, sort of how your, like, I guess, Syrian heritage and, like, being around these, like, growing up in an Arab home impacted some religious holidays. Um, so... It didn't really. Yeah. It really you, didn't because uh, we were, we were, I mean, we went to the Catholic church, St. Anselm's, uh, or... My mother's sisters, they went to St. Mary's, which was the Orthodox. They may have been more traditionally Syrian, but my family, you know, was very American, um, except for food and the language and hanging out with, with family, and family was so important. You know, we were Americans. So did you fast for Easter or no? Nothing like that. No, no, no. No, we just did whatever the Catholic Church told us. <laughs> uh, and but my husband and I were married in the uh, Melkite Church. Just because I, I always felt mother was, she wasn't a holy roller Catholic. Um, she always said, you know, I come home from school and I'd say, Oh, the nun said that Auntie Marguerite is going to hell. Because my Aunt Marguerite was Catholic. She married someone who was Orthodox in the Orthodox Church. And I knew that. And so I came home from school. Nun said, that's, you know, they're not married. So they're going to go to hell. In fact, a priest when my Aunt Marguerite was dying, wouldn't give her the last sacraments because of this marriage. My mother was not enamored of the Catholic Church. And she would say, God gave you a brain to, to use it, to think, use it, you know. And so she instilled in us critical thinking. Um, so in terms of church and religion and um we we thought for ourselves um so maybe moving back to you just mentioned your um aunt weddings were weddings a big deal um growing up oh, did you go to oh. a lot? i've had oh, a lot yeah. of um, arab people talking about sort of wedding season during the summers is that something yeah yeah and we always, at all the weddings, we did the debke. You know what that is? The dance. We always did that. Um, yeah. Is that something that was part of your wedding? Like, could you yeah. talk about yeah. the traditional elements? Uh, 
Well, the only thing we did was the Debco. You know, we, we had our reception in a hotel. Um, it was a dinner. We had 110 people. Um, and uh, yeah, we just, we danced American uh, dances. We danced, uh, you know, the, the Debka, that music is just so invigorating. It just makes you want to get up and, and dance and yeah. Is it something you taught your own children? No, no. no. They were married. My boys were married, married American girls and uh, my daughter married someone who's Polish. <laughs> Uh, so that, you know, the, my kids are very proud of their Arabic heritage. Um, and they're very aware of where they came from. Um, they, they do make the food. My boys cook Syrian food. My daughter does. Um, but, you know, they're Americans now. They really are. Do you wish, I mean, you, you just said they, they do eat a lot of it. Is there any sort of dishes from your childhood that you wish that you um, still sort of knew how to make or? Well, really important uh, ones? The, I, I have this great cookbook. <laughs> I have a lot of good cookbooks. Um, uh, so if I forget, you know, I can go. But I, I, I'm, I'm a pretty intuitive Kurt, a cook. Uh, so, you know, I, I know what things are supposed to taste like. The only thing I have trouble making is, you know, those cookies that they make, they're called ma'mul, you fill them with, um, with dates or you fill them with nuts. And uh, you put, you take the dough and you put it in a mold and then you put the dates in there and then you cover it with um, some more dough and you then press the mold. Well, I cannot do that anymore. That is something that I have such a, maybe my molds aren't any good anymore, but my mom, instead of doing that, she had this like little pincher with prongs at the end and she would decorate those cookies uh, with this little pincher. Uh, so, but you know, one thing culturally and around food was always the men had, had priority. The men and the, and the boys were always served first. That was, I don't know, there was this deference to the male in the family. You're talking about culture and food. And do you think that was so stemming from like your, the Arab traditions? Or absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Arabic. Uh, there was a book that I read about a Lebanese couple. I think it was called Zahra. I, mean, I read it many, many years ago. And um, what stuck in my mind about this story was the woman and her daughter, well, the woman would make dinner and she would take it out to the son and the father in the, in the dining room and they would eat. And then uh, Zahra and her daughter ate in the kitchen. And I remember my grandmother, when she would come over for dinner, my mom would make chicken and she would always take the least desirable part. She would, you know, she would take the back of the chicken. It was like she wasn't worthy to have a piece of the breast or uh, that always it, it stuck in my memory how grandma was. But I mean, her was husband about it. I'm sorry. Um, was that ever spoken about or was it? So no. No, 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 no. But she, she, she chose to, to take the worst part of the chicken. Maybe she thought it was the best tasting, but, you know. But I, at the dinner table, my father and my brothers were always served first. Not that, you know, uh, uh, my mother, that's the way she was. 
And, and she was, um, you know, she ran a business. She wasn't a, a wimp, you know. In fact, she was a better businesswoman than my father. Um, they, um, you know, she ran that factory with my father. And I think that, you know, she was a strong one. Hi, Eric. <laughs> Wait, Eric, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask on another uh, tack, were there any sort of non-culinary tradition, like you mentioned and sent us the picture of the uh, silks that were sort of traditional from Syria, and are there any other sort of objects like that that you remember as being? Well, uh, my father, my my grandfather gave my mother this table and it was inlaid with mother of pearl and all different kinds of woods. You'd, you'd see that. Um, I don't know where you could get a picture of that because I don't have one. It was a beautiful table uh, from Syria and we kids destroyed it. <laughs> we would pick out the pieces of uh, wood or the... Uh, it, it was like a mosaic, a beautiful, beautiful uh, table. Um, you know, we'd take out the mother of pearl or whatever. You know, five kids can do a lot of damage in a house. <laughs> Especially we were seven years apart. Yeah. So, yeah. And we always had oriental rugs. My grandfather uh, imported Joseph Humsey, Humsey. He, he imported, that was one of his businesses. He imported oriental rugs. Uh, so he always had that. Now that shawl that I sent you a picture of, it was silk. And they, Joseph Holmesy made that in his factory. But this was in the 20s. This was, uh, I don't think this was necessarily a, an Arabic uh, artifacts. Remember, we're going through the 20s and you have flappers and they made these shawls for the uh, American market. It wasn't, it was more of an American thing, but they, the silk making came from uh, grandpa's, um, you know, he, from his factory, but there was silk making in Aleppo. And so the tradition of, of making silk fabric and silk things came from Syria through, through Joseph. Were there specific, um, I guess, gifts that were given, um, maybe silk that was given on Christmas, on birthdays, um, well, related back to this Syrian? Okay. Yeah, well, um, Let's see, my things that, that other than toys, um, tablecloths, my uh, Uncle Joe, he manufactured um, he, linen tablecloths that they would applique designs on um, and handkerchiefs. Um, uh, I remember getting handkerchiefs from China. My, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, her brother, William, uh, lived in China with his brother, Emil. So Emil and William Abushar exported um, Chinese uh, lace, Chinese handkerchiefs, Chinese cloth, uh, until the Japanese um, uh, invaded. Uh, uh, they were in, oh, I can't think of where they were. Anyway, Uncle, Uncle William and his wife and my cousin escaped, but Emil was captured by the, uh, by the Japanese. You know, the Syrians, they, they were in, in Syria, the damask tablecloth, damask clothing 
is something that's very beautiful that came from Syria. And so I think that was why Uncle Joe made these tablecloths. And I think my grandfather did, but um, he did so many things. Uh, he had so many different businesses. But I, uh, we had those tablecloths. Uh, we had the handkerchiefs from China, lace. Uh, and then William, William um, came back to the United States and he imported stuff. And eventually he went to Barcelona and um, he was the president of the American Chamber of Commerce in Barcelona. So, but, you know, yeah, we had stuff that was from Syria, um, from the Middle East, uh, or, or things that were like the things that came from Syria because um, my family didn't, didn't go back. Um, the only ones that I think went back after they, they came here was my father's father. And he went back twice, once to get a wife uh, and then to, to travel around the Mideast to purchase rugs, carpets for his, for his business. But after that, you know, Syria was over there and we were here. And I think that may be different from what's going on with, with uh, Arab Americans or uh, Arab uh, immigrants. I, I would make um, one of the simplest dishes I could, which was an eggplant dish, which was called, um, uh, uh, oh, right out of my mind. Um, Nesla. And um, everyone loved it. But it, it's, you know, just a simple eggplant dish with meat and tomato. And when I would, when I'd have company, I would often make Syrian food, uh, which everyone loved. That's all I wanted to add. I don't think I mentioned that when we were talking about food and culture. No, yeah. But thank you so much for sharing. Yeah.